Hello, everyone. Today on the final bar, my guest is Ryan Dietrich from LPL Financial. Going to give us a big picture view of what to expect from the S&P here in the coming weeks and months, looking at some historical perspective. Looking at today's trading, we have the spectacle of the GameStop Robinhood uh, uh, hearings happening today. The end, the, uh, the market really selling off in the morning, coming, you know, regaining about half of that back uh, by the close, but overall uh, more distribution than accumulation. Uh, if I were to summarize it a certain way, energy, which has been in the driver's seat back at the bottom. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a snowy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we make sense of these markets together, focusing on the message of the markets themselves, focusing on supply and demand, fear and greed, all those emotional uh, states of investors that manifest themselves into uh, stock prices and asset prices. As we've mentioned, you know, sort of a choppy day today. Yesterday was really about uh, strength going into the close uh, today, you know, sort of giving back some of those gains uh, and uh, the S&P closing around 39.15. Some, some interesting movements. And we, it's a heavy earnings stretch, uh, of course, after the close today. We've got a couple of companies uh, reporting uh, S&P names to pay attention to. But overall, seeing quite a bit of movement on, uh, on both sides. And overall, plenty of signs of, you know, potential topping patterns, uh, especially in the short term. We're going to look at some of the non-confirmations or bearish divergences that we've been talking about. But something like energy coming off today really drives home that issue of stocks moving higher on lessening momentum, which doesn't tend to be a short-term positive thing. Long-term could be a different story. We'll try to separate the two as best we can. We have some great guests coming up on the show. Excited to talk to Ryan Dietrich today in a, in a short while. Next week on Tuesday the 23rd, we have Keith Fitzgerald from the Fitzgerald Group. On Wednesday, the 24th, Tim Tashler from Sprott Global. And then on Thursday, uh, February 25th, author and trader Cliff Droke coming back on the show. Let's continue on to our market recaps. I mentioned sort of a choppy environment overall. The S&P down about 0.4% to close just below 39.15. Mid caps and small caps down a lot more. I've been doing some media, uh, you know, outgoing media recently talking about the market environment, talking about, you know, again, given the, um, the, um, hearings for, uh, you know, with GameStop and Robinhood and Citadel all uh, sort of uh, debating and discussing what all has happened in recent months, you know, in terms of what signals you look for um, that is indicating uh, more of a uh, topping environment, more of a situation where investors are getting nervous, investors are trying to pull out sort of risk off versus risk on. One of the better things to look at might be uh, small cap stocks, right? If you think about what's really been, uh, you know, moving pretty well in recent months, it's small caps, it's micro caps, that have outperformed handily because uh, that's where a lot of the more speculative names, more higher beta names uh, tend to be. Uh, so on a day like today, we have uh, small caps down one and a half percent while the S&P down just under a third of that sort of speaks to more, uh, at least on, on one day's perspective, more risk off versus risk on. The VIX back uh, higher above 22 to 22.3 or so. 10-year yields essentially uh, chopping around the, uh, the 130 mark uh, a little bit below uh, uh, closing today is above it uh, earlier today. So bonds not a huge mover. The TLT was down about 0.4%. Mixed signals from, uh, from commodities overall, uh, a couple of them uh, higher. Gold essentially flat. The DBC, sort of our uh, one of the broad commodity indexes we tracked down, this is after a stretch of being up fairly consistently. So a bit of a give back today. Energy price is weaker, and that's why the XLE is uh, the weakest of the 11 S&P sectors. Uh, Thursday's a big sentiment today, so a little later in today's show, we're going to have a segment called Getting Sentimental, where we focus on some of the sentiment readings. Uh, so we'll get to that in a little bit and talk about the euphoric conditions, I would argue, are still uh, persisting there in a couple different couple different measurements. You know, it's interesting, as we're looking at the S&P come off today, I have this trend line, uh, which is using the late October low, sort of the end of that basing pattern before we broke out a coil pattern of lower highs and higher lows that resolved to the upside there in uh, early mid-November, continued to break out uh, and push 
uh, higher to reach 39.50 um, earlier this week. But if you look at the trend line from the lows, take the October low, that lines up with the December low, that lined up pretty well with uh, mid-January, again, late January, and then we broke it. And that was sort of one of the first uh, indications that things were getting a little uncomfortable here uh, for uh, on the bullish side. I haven't really extended that trend line. And then I was thinking earlier, if you do extend that trend line, we actually now have retested that trend line from below and now potentially rolling over. Now, all of this, I think, still is sort of uh, speculating as to the conditions for a, a, a rollover. I, I think if you ask anyone, are we owed, overdue for a correction? I don't hear a lot of people did you know, denying that that certainly seems to be the case just in terms of how far we've come. And, and even if you're bullish, I would argue the best thing you could see would be a retracement of some sort of all of these gains that we've had. Because all that does is it resets things. It resets the counter. It, it resets people that are able to get back in, people that missed out, that are, that are uh, you know, opportunistic and are looking for buying in on some sort of dip. This is arguably what you saw in late January. We pull back to the 50-day I think something uh, further in time and or price over the long term would probably be one of the best things that could happen. Otherwise, you just continue to trudge higher and it feels less and less realistic. And that's when things uh, start to get ugly, when all of a sudden we're, we're way beyond what we should be what, by whatever definition, valuation or whatever that you use. Uh, and then things can get can get pretty painful. So having said that, you know, looking to see when we break through some interim lows, that would be the key. Breaking below the 50-day, currently around 37.85, that would be the first step. Breaking below 3,700, which would be the low from late January, that'd be the second uh, signal. The Fibonacci support level based on the October to um, you know to February rally, that would be the next step. So breaking some of those support levels would be key. Below there, you're now looking at 3,500, which would be the next. Fibonacci support level, the 200-day moving average is going to be not far from there uh, in the next couple of weeks. I would say the ultimate line in the sand for the bullish case would be S&P 3200. That would take us below that congestion area uh, from last September. And, and a break below there, if we would get down all the way down to that level, I think that's when you'd really have to rethink the bullish thesis and think about something a little more uh, severe. I wouldn't be surprised if at some point we get down here over the course of the coming months. Uh, but again, the first thing to happen is we have to start breaking support levels. We haven't really been able to do that. The last attempt to do so late January really didn't follow through much to the downside. Again, we'll talk about sentiment more in a little bit, but I did want to talk about breadth. In tomorrow's show, we'll dig a little deeper into, uh, into some of these charts and focus on the message. But I did want to focus on breadth in the form of the accumulative advanced decline lines. You know, we look at advanced decline lines a couple different ways when you look at um, you know, every day, how many stocks are closing higher than lower. That's a daily reading we can, uh, we can look at just to measure the overall participation day to day. But this is a way that we, uh, you know, have a cumulative measure. So you add up those advanced decline readings every day and you get a, an overall trend in advances decliners. You know, by my read, this is still very supportive, right? Prices moving to new closing highs, the cumulative advanced decline lines making to new all-time highs, that's all very bullish. You know, that pattern has to stop going higher for you to be less bullish, I think, using this sort of technique. So, you know, looking for some sort of divergence where the market's going higher on lower breadth. We're not seeing that, that on this particular indicator. You are arguably seeing it on something like the bullish percent index, um, uh, but but not in this particular uh, on this particular chart. One of my guests this week, Gary Dean, I want to say on Tuesday, we, we looked at that um, uh, bullish percent index. So if you missed it, uh, go back and watch Tuesday's show. You'll see that discussion about a, a breadth indicator based on point and figure charts. But by this read, uh, you know, the advanced decline lines making higher highs in, in the form of the, you know, the daily read, I think overall is still very supportive. You're seeing no divergences. Uh, you know, in January, February of 2020, you saw clear divergences, price going higher. These indicators uh, making lower peaks, we're not getting that situation. January to February of 2021, you're seeing stronger breadth in this, uh, in this form. So, you know, not giving you any sort of warning signs. So there aren't a ton of warning signs. There's some on there. Now, what, what are we seeing that is, uh, that is a cause for concern? Well, I mentioned energy down today. You can look at the XLE here. The, the pattern on the XLE is a pattern you're seeing on uh, a couple different charts here. Let me bring up this chart that has the uh, RSI on here. The challenge you're seeing on the XLE, on the uh, XLF, the financial sector, on some other charts as well, is this pattern. You know, traditionally, when the price moves higher and higher, the momentum should be consistent or improving. And that tells you that every time we move to higher highs, there's more and more momentum behind that upswing. What we're seeing over the last uh, you know, month or so is higher peaks in the XLE, in the XLF, so energy financials, lower peaks in the RSI. And it's still sort of early days where right? we're just coming off a little bit from 
uh, you know, just below 46. So it's not really dramatically coming off those uh, those recent swing highs, but it's worth noting that the momentum is lessening. On the S&P chart itself, as I was talking with Peter Brandt yesterday, higher highs in price, lower peaks in the in the RSI. So, you know, I, I've often joked, uh, you know, with something like divergences, uh, you know, bearish divergences have called 10 of the last three major tops, right, as a, as a way to illustrate, you get a lot of false negatives on something like this. You'll get divergences that don't actually play out. But for me, seeing these uh, divergences, seeing, seeing waning momentum on strengthening prices puts it on my list uh, to follow and watching to see if that materializes. If we break down in price, if we break down through swing lows, break down through support, that's where you have to get a little more concerned. We don't have a ton of time to go through other themes. I would note utilities, the number one sector out of the 11. It's rare to see that at the top of the list here. REITs uh, were the number three. Consumer discretionary, traditionally thought of as uh, more of an offensive sector, um, second flat for the day, but uh, outperforming the market. On the bottom, you had energy, followed by materials, followed by healthcare, and energy really the, the leading the way uh, lower. It's worth noting, pay attention to some of these uh, scooter reports on some of the stocks uh, on the move. We're seeing a lot of rotation, especially in the top 10 list in large cap, mid cap, and also small cap. We need to uh, wrap that segment. We'll take a quick commercial break. Back with my guest, Ryan Dietrich. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. So good to have you join us every weekday after the close as we review key charts together and focus on the message of the markets themselves. As a reminder, we have a mailbag segment on Friday show. We'd love to answer one of your questions during that uh, segment. Three ways you can get your questions to us. Number one, via email, the final bar at StockCharts.com. Number two, on Twitter, at Final Bar SCTV. Finally, on our YouTube channel, just put a comment below the video that you're watching. We'll gather all of those questions. Nothing out of bounds. We'll do our best to point you in the right direction when it comes to investor psychology, market dynamics, technical analysis, trend following, momentum investing, market history, whatever it is top of mind, we'll do our best to uh, answer your questions on our next mailbag segment on Friday's show. I want to welcome on my guest, Ryan Dietrich. Ryan's a strategist at LPL Financial based in Charlotte. Ryan, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Dave. I'm honored to be here. Appreciate the opportunity. I mentioned beforehand, it was so good to have you participate in our year-end special programming. Looking back, sort of doing a retrospective on, uh, on, the, uh, on the markets. And if I remember right, your segment was something about the seven-year itch and looking at the seven-year pattern. So I'm thrilled that that's where we're starting, looking at secular bull markets and how they evolve. Start us with this long-term chart of the S&P. What are you seeing? Yeah, Dave, before I go there, I do want to point out one thing. Everyone talks about all this volatility in the market. Today was the seventh day in a row. The S&P 500 did not close up half a percent or down half a percent. Okay, so it's kind of hanging out. All right. We hear about all this volatility. That's the longest stretch without so much as a half a percent move, either up or down since last August, the dog days of August. So it's just, you know, it's interesting. We hear what the media tell us and then it's like, well, maybe it's not so volatile. So I just want to point that out. But, you know, big picture as, as a market strategist. Yes, I have my CMT. I'm a, I follow charts and things. I like to take the big picture look at things here. And I think the key thing is on this chart here, you know, look at secular bull markets. 1950 to 1968 was a secular bull market. The seven-year itch says, hey, after seven years, you get tired of something, right? Markets are very human. Markets do the same thing. There was a bear market in 1957 and a recession. Fast forward to everyone says 82 bull market. I think the bull market really started in 80. That's when stocks were up 30% and made new highs for the first time after a terrible decade in the 70s. So there you go. So from 80 to 2000, another major secular bull market, as we remember. Add seven to 80. What do you get, Dave? 87, 34% correction. What happened after that, though? Stocks went up for 13 years. The other seven year itch in 1957, stocks went up for 11 years. Now, the key thing about this one, everyone says this bull market started in 2009. Maybe not everyone. A lot of people do. I think it's 2013. That's when we broke out after going nowhere for 13 years. If you add seven to 2013, what do you get? 
2020. Now, we didn't expect what happened last year. I'll be very clear. But again, what Mark Twain tell us, history doesn't repeat, but it often rhymes. Now that we've recovered from the seven-year itch, maybe there could be a lot more life left to this major secular bowl than a lot of people think. And that's from the big picture point of view, I think what's so powerful for investors to remember. It's such a great long-term perspective. And, and, and I love your comments at the beginning. It's you know relating the narrative to the, the, the history, right? And seeing what's actually happened. It, Arguably, we could be at the beginning of something much further. Now, when we look at some of the historical analogs, your second chart is really relating where we're at now versus some of these historical periods. Talk, talk us through this one. That's right. So what I've got here is just this bull market. It's the dark blue, shaded blue, with the previous best starts to a bull market ever, the 82 bull and then the 2009 bull. Those were the strongest ones ever. And we shared this chart a lot at LPL Research with our more than 17,000 advisors. And who knows, Dave, I might have shared this chart with you last time I was on with you a while back, saying, listen, this is an amazing start to this bull market that we started off March 23rd. But we said, listen, we could follow the pattern from the two previous bulls, and there could be a lot more life left. Well, as you can see, that's clearly played out. But the key point here, kind of what you talked about before I came on, listen, we're up 75 76% from the lows, double in small caps, double in technology, NASDAQ. We get all that. With the two previous best bulls ever for the next you know, four or five months or so, what did they do? Kind of choppy, kind of sideways. If you're bullish, I don't think, you know, I guess laid out in the first chart why we think stocks will go higher for a while here. But if you're really bullish, maybe a sideways consolidation and heaven forbid a 10% correction after a 76% rally, that might be the most bullish thing that could happen is markets can catch their breath. And I think just paying attention to history reminds us, don't think this is going to go on forever. Maybe a little break is due and warranted. It's such a great take, and and I, I think we're we're in alignment on the on the potential for you know giving back some of these gains. Arguably, could be the best thing to happen if long term you know a, a bullish scenario is going to play out. So, given your expectation, we only have about thirty seconds left, Brian. But you know, if you had new money to work today, given where we're at in the cycle, given given the fact that we're you know we've had this run relative to previous runs, where would you be looking opportunistically? Is it is it in any particular areas, sectors, or or places you would be looking right now? Yeah, I mean, we we really like the cyclical value. I mean, financials literally have gone nowhere. Remember, I just mentioned 13 years, S&P went nowhere. Financials are breaking out for the first time in 13 years, right? The emerging markets breaking out for the first time in 13, 14 years. So those groups that have gone nowhere forever. Japan, I mean, I know you've talked about Japan, gone nowhere for 31 years. Now they're above 30,000 on the Nikkei. Those are the areas that have, you know, people think, oh, too far, too fast. Well, maybe not, okay? They've gone nowhere for a long time. Those are the areas as the economy opens up, maybe can continue to do quite well in our opinion. That's a great take, Ryan. It's so good to have you on, as always. I really, uh, really appreciate your take and, uh, and focusing on the long-term message of the markets. Hope you stay safe, those around you as well, and we'll uh, talk to you again soon, Ryan. Absolutely. Dave, I got to say, OH, I know you're an Ohio boy like me, so we got to stick I together. O. Thank you. There we go. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> See you, man. Take care. <laughs> Cheers, Ryan. That's Ryan Dietrich. Ryan's the chief market strategist at LPL Financial a fellow uh, native Ohioan. Uh, so uh, good to chat with him uh, as always. But I, I love that take, you know, when, when someone like Ryan, who, who clearly knows his stuff, when I think of him, it's about market history and it's about focusing on the long-term evolution of the markets. It, it's so easy to get caught up in the short-term, short-termism, the flickering ticks of the market, the, you know, quick drivers up and down and, and the day-to-day the -day movements in stocks. Make sure that we're focused appropriately on the long-term trends, especially if you're a long-term investor. Make sure that your analysis, that your outlook, is in line with uh, with your uh, what 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 questions you are trying to answer as an investor. Our next segment is called "Getting Sentimental." We love to do on Thursdays, uh, Wednesday to Thursday. You get a lot of sentiment data that's updated, so it's always good to check in on some of the uh, sentiment indicators, what they're telling it. You know, as we've talked about many times. Um, you know, for me, I think of a market analysis, big picture analysis, in three parts: price breadth and sentiment. And for me, those are the priority order. That's the priority order of the three. It starts with price. If you look at nothing else, look at the price of the asset itself, look at the S&P and focus on the message of the markets, right? Focus on the trends, focus on the overall uh, uh, movement of the market itself. Second is breadth. Look at how that movement is confirmed or not confirmed by the stocks that comprise those, uh, those indexes that you're looking at. What is the average stock doing uh, and looking at different measures of that? Finally, a sentiment. For me, sentiment tends to be more anecdotal. It's a way that you understand what's driving sort of those first two uh, decisions. But, you know, for years, uh, you know, the, the Fidelity chart room, we would focus on magazine covers and blog headlines and, you know, big picture indications of, uh, of investor sentiment. And, and history is peppered with examples of where 
market uh, uh, perspective has become euphoric or desperate. You've seen signs of euphoria where the market can never go down again. You, and when the market sells off, you have signs of desperation that the market could, you know, will never go up again. Uh, and that's how you get the death of equities in 1979 before the biggest bull market in history. That's how you have getrich.com at the 2000 high, uh, talking about technology stocks that will continue to go up uh, ad infinitum. Uh, and that, of course, did not happen. So where are we at right now with sentiment indicators? First is the VIX. I think uh, Ryan Dietrich's comments a little earlier are very well taken. You know, the narrative is increased volatility. If you look at the day-to-day -day movement, it's something like the S&P. We've, we've had some digestion days. And, and, and the, that's what I usually call them, sort of those days that aren't really directional movements. It's not really pushing you know, buyers or sellers, neither of them have real control over the direction of the market. There's not significant buying power or selling pressure. It's more of a digestion move. There's, there are movements in individual, individual stocks. There's some short-term fluctuations, but overall directionally, we haven't gone anywhere. And I tend to call those digestion days. Uh, we've had plenty of those recently. If you look at the S&P itself, you know, before today where we came off a bit, up until then, we really haven't all, had a lot of significant movements one way or the other. Having said that, the volatility regime now, if you look at the last 12 months versus the 12 months before that, uh, we're in a different realm altogether. You know, the average VIX level back here was sort of in the upper, you know, mid to upper teens, maybe 15, 16, I guess, would probably be the average VIX reading uh, in 2019. And at the lows, it was around 10 to 12. At the highs, it was uh, about 20, maybe a little bit above that. That completely changed right in March of 2020 when the VIX exploded up to one of its highest readings in history. Since then, we've been fluctuating between 20 and 40. So when I think about volatility increasing, the fear increasing, I'm seeing this and just the overall range of the VIX uh, being much more elevated now than it was a year ago, right? And, and years prior to that. Having said that, we're coming off one of the lowest VIX readings uh, this year, right? And when the VIX has hit 20 to 22, this has been uh, in August, which was just before the September peak. Uh, December, which was really, uh, you know, it was a pause time-wise for a couple of weeks before a resumption of the uptrend. And then this current reading, which uh, when the VIX hit 20, that's the lowest it's been since February 20, uh, February 2020. So, you know, overall, the VIX has been uh, relatively low. A low VIX reading has tended to coincide with uh, with market peaks at times, but it's not 100% of the time. And certainly that is not a range bound indicator. The VIX can get much lower than it is. It can also get much higher than it is. So it's all about where it is relative to historical extremes. The VIX right now at one of the lower levels it's been for the last year. That's data point number one. Data point number two is looking at the AAII survey. This is the weekly survey of individual investors. Again, it's a subset of the uh, individual investing community that responds to this weekly survey. This week, the, the reading coming out today, 47% bullish, uh, just over 25% uh, bearish. That's the lowest percent of bears that we've had uh, since mid-December of last year. That's the highest number of bulls we've had since late November of last year. So in general, when I see a, a, a bullish reading above 50%, that's putting us in a very small uh, set of observations of extreme uh, bullishness. We're not quite there. We're very close to there. So what we've seen uh, you know, uh, most recently with this is a spike higher in November, and since then, uh, sort of lower readings in the upper, uh, upper 40s overall. The name exposure index is the National Association of Active Investment Managers. These are more money managers saying whether they are 100 or 200 percent long, 100 or 200 percent short, or flat uh, zero percent equities, and, and it's updated every week as well. This week a little bit lower than yesterday, but still net uh, leveraged long with 100 percent, 108 percent, excuse me, uh, bullish reading. This is now the fourth highest reading in history by uh, by my uh, read of the data. So uh, still in the upper end of uh, extremes. Three of those high, four highest readings have been in the last month. Before then, it was December of 2017 when you had the next highest reading. So if you look back there as, as one historical analog, that was about a month before the uh, the peak in 2000, uh, January 2018. And again, we chopped around for a while. We ended up making, making a new subsequent high before selling off into a low in December of 2018. Um, so overall, sort of uh, near the end of a bull market phase, but not quite there. Finally, we'll finish off with the put call ratios. And, and again, you know, if I would describe the put call ratio, it reminds me a little bit of the VIX, where you know they're not necessarily range bound; they are to a degree, but not uh, you know significantly. You'll still see some fluctuations. But the readings you're getting on the put call ratios, we'll look at this one, which is the put call ratios uh, on equities uh, only. 
uh, which is dollar sign CPCE, you can see that we're still in sort of the lowest range that we've been. A reading of 0.4 is one of the lowest readings in history, right? But we've been at those pretty low levels. The lowest reading that I've seen in terms of looking at the average, uh, this is the uh, five-day average that I use uh, for the put call ratio. The lowest reading we have was in mid-January when it got to around 0.37 on the average. The absolute reading got to the lowest level we've seen, which was uh, there the second week in January. So overall, we're still relatively low compared to other things. What this indicates is a in an extreme uh, uh, you know volume on the call side, suggesting you know investors are very bullishly positioned. If you take this subset of the uh, investing landscape, looking at uh, options in particular, not on indexes but just on uh, on uh, equities. So having said that, you know at some point, uh, my friend Tom McClellan uh, tweeted out earlier today or yesterday, I, I forget when. Uh, basically, at some point, this has to mean something. And I, I, that's how I'm looking at it. I'm seeing these sentiment readings at extreme euphoric levels when I look at the uh, name exposure index, when I look at the put call ratios, when I look at the VIX, when I look at um, the uh, AAII survey. These are all at pretty extreme uh, readings. The market can continue to go higher. That's absolutely right. But we're in similar conditions to what would tell me if I'm trying to measure euphoria any way I can, I'm getting pretty euphoric readings right about now. That is our segment, Getting Sentimental, just updating on some of the uh, sentiment readings that we've seen in the last week, how that relates to some historical patterns. We need to wrap the show, go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one is the S&P breadth by cap tiers. We talked about this a little earlier when we were doing our market recap. I just want to, we're going to reiterate, you know, there, what, what I tend to think about macro technical analysis is your most important thing you can do is look at a chart of the S&P 500. If you want to know what's going to happen with the S&P 500 and make a, uh, a good technical uh, evaluation of the state of the S&P, look at the chart of the S&P. Focus on highs and lows, support and resistance levels, trend lines, moving averages. That's what's going to tell you the overall trajectory of the market. From there, you have things like breadth and sentiment, which help you validate or invalidate, qualify or disqualify what you're seeing in the trends in the overall price. And when I'm looking at breadth in the form of the cumulative advanced decline lines, one thing I am not seeing now are bearish divergences. You know, a classic bull market ending playbook, a bull market top playbook for me would involve the market going higher, but these cumulative advanced decline lines sloping lower. We're actually not seeing that right now. We're seeing a continued uptrend. So a lower peak in these cumulative advanced decline lines would be much more of a sign of a top than anything I'm seeing right now. Overall, I'm seeing the breadth uh, net net being fairly supportive. Now, where are the breadth indicators I'm seeing that are not supporting this two in particular, the bullish percent index, which again, we talked about on Tuesday's show. So if you missed that, go back to the, to the, uh, to the tape, you can see, uh, you can see what we talked about there. That's based on point and figure charts here. We're looking at the percent of S and P stocks above their 50 day moving average here in blue. It's the percent of stocks above their 200 day. It's actually remained relatively elevated, still almost 90%, nine out of 10 of S and P names above their 200 day moving average. If you look here at the percent above their 50 day moving average, it's around 69%, which again, still seven out of 10 is not bad. But what's interesting is look at this divergence. Every uh, high we've made in 2021, we've had less and less stocks above their 50 day, which means every time we move higher, the S&P has essentially remained above its 50 day for this, uh, you know, for the last couple months. But as the S&P has pulled back and then moved to another leg higher, less and less stocks are actually continuing up uh, using this as the measure, stocks above their, their 50 days. So that is more uh, actually non-confirmational. And when I talk about non-confirmation, two breadth indicators come to mind, the bullish percent index and the percent of stocks above their 50 day. It tells you there may be some weakness under the hood. Now, where are you seeing some of that weakness manifest itself in prices? Plug power is one of those stocks. When I think about these uh, the hearings right now, looking at GameStop and, uh, GameStop and AMC, uh, sort of the short squeeze names, I'm, I'm drawn to other sort of frothy uh, names that I think have a social media tilt to them. Things like uh, clean energy, plug power has been one of the top ranked uh, stocks. It's been the number one stock in our mid cap scooter ranking for months and months. Finally got unseated uh, this week. Uh, it's now second in a long list of mid cap stocks. So don't get me wrong. It's not over according to the scooter rankings, but it has lost its top, uh, its top billing down almost 11% today, right at the 50 day moving average. When I think about the market. And when I think about its ability to persist in an uptrend, stocks like this should pull back, but it should hold support at some point. So I am eyeing the $50 uh, mark. I'm eyeing the 50-day moving average on a chart like this. And I'm curious whether or not 
that will be able to hold. Folks, that is our show for today. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday for the final bar. A special thank you to Ryan Dietrich from LPL Financial sharing his thoughts today. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a good night. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.